You know what that sound means? It means it's another episode of Game for a Movie where we ask, are you game for a movie? My name is Mike. I'll be your host this evening. I am joined by no one, actually. So there's nothing wrong. There's no problems, nothing like that. It has become ridiculously hard with our schedules to record all of us at the same time. Not only record, but also watch bad movies together, that kind of stuff. I am getting this out here because you lovely people deserve content. I have watched a bad movie. I'm going to give you the rundown of the bad movie. I also might do this a little quicker than our normal episodes. Our normal episodes run about an hour. I'm probably going to do this maybe 40 minutes or so. Maybe less or maybe more. Who knows? I just want to give you all of my thoughts on this movie and I want to make sure you get that content you've come to know and love from Game for a Movie. Andre and Jill are still very much a part of this. So is Mitchell. So is T-Dog, if he ever shows up again. Everybody is perfectly fine. This is also a very good time to announce that I am launching a division of Game for a Movie. Game for a Movie is still the main. Be all, end all. I want it to be a part of this. But as we keep having weeks where we're not able to meet up, that kind of thing, to release some content... I've decided on a new show that is a division of Game for a Movie. It is called Ice Stream. Ice Stream is all about ice cream and then whatever you can stream on streaming services. I'm going to try to watch some of the more up-to-date, newer things, tell you if they're worth your shot or not. As always, uh, there's going to be some good movies, some shit, some TV. Who knows what I'm going to get involved into, but that's going to be Ice Stream. It is only going to run on weeks where we cannot get a Game for a Movie episode together. And it's probably just going to be launched under the same name or under the same umbrella because I I don't want to lose everybody, honestly. It truly is a blast to be able to talk about good movies, bad movies with some of your best friends. So, Game for a Movie, main show, it's not going anywhere. I would prefer to record Game for a Movie episodes over iStream any single day of the week. But, because you deserve content and because I don't want to go like we have the last two months without an episode, I am launching a separate project. It's not even that separate. But I'm launching a separate project so that there's constant content coming your way. If you like the sound of my voice... Please check out iStream when I launch it, which is hopefully going to be in two weeks. Uh, I will be at my a good buddy of mine's bachelor party uh, this weekend, so there's probably not going to be a Game for a Movie episode or an iStream episode, but I still hope to get new content out for you shortly. All right, enough about that announcement. Let's jump into what am I drinking. We always do this on the show. I have a Foam Economics Pilsner. It is a slow pour Pilsner from Black Pond Brews, which is in Dayville, Connecticut. I host trivia there sometimes. They just put this on their menu. It is a hoppy Pilsner. And it's been described as it takes five minutes to pour. Trust me, it is worth every minute waiting for it. It's like a Guinness in the fact that it just gets better the more you let it sit. I chugged it when I was hosting trivia there the other night. They gave me a four-pack after the night, and let me tell you right now, I have let this sit after I cracked it open. This is going to be the first sip. It's still delightful in the can. And I don't get paid more for trivia by giving them a shout-out, but I do like them a lot. I just wish they weren't as far away as they are. They're an hour and a half from my house, so it takes three hours for me to drive there and back. This place would be my local neighborhood bar if it was closer. Enough about what I'm drinking. Let's talk about what I watched. As Being Bookish podcast guest on our Twitter account, that is at Game for a Movie, you can always guess our bad movie, and you can get your promo featured in the episode if you guess it first. I watched 2017's The Mummy. The one with Tom Cruise. Yes, that one. So here are some of my thoughts on the movie. I'm going to tell you basically... My notes as I was watching this movie, because I typed a lot of them, there's like five pages of notes, 1,010 words. Uh, Normally it's a little more fun when we have some people interject, so if you guys have thoughts, comments, concerns, 
You can reach out to us at Game for a Movie on Twitter, at Game for a Movie on Facebook, or at Game for a Movie on Instagram. We also have a TikTok as well. That's when I'll be taking you behind the bad. I don't know why I'm just sending you on a wild goose chase to find all our stuff, but you should follow us if you love us. Let's get started with this movie, The Mummy from 2017. We start this movie, and we are in England, 1127 AD. Yes, England. This is not Egypt. That threw me off right off the bat, but at least they did kind of cover it. Uh, we see a guy go into a coffin, and that's all we learn. That's all we find before we flash to the present. Present day. They are making a new railway line in London, and they just so happen to come across this crypt filled with a bunch of coffins of dead... They, we learn through news position, which is exposition through the newscasts, uh, that these are crusader knights, and that they invaded Egypt before they returned to London. I don't know why we need these crusader knights, but they're crusader knights. They invaded Egypt, and they returned to London. That's all I know so far. One of the people that discovers the crypt is Henry Jekyll. And the only reason I know this is because I know what they were trying to do with the whole Dark Universe. If you don't know about the Dark Universe, this was going to be the first movie of many that brought all the monsters together. So there was going to be the Mummy, there was going to be Dracula, Wolfman, uh, I think the Creature from the Black Lagoon. All of these were supposed to be brought together. Oh, and Frankenstein. And Russell Crowe plays Dr. Henry Jekyll. You can only guess what monster he plays. Uh, so he starts monologuing in his head... And I don't know at this point if I would have rather him just talk out loud to himself because he's just laying out exposition and he knows this whole story of Aminette, who is the mummy in question. She's played by Sophia Butella. Uh, basically, she was promised the throne and then all of a sudden the pharaoh had a son. And we all know how it usually works with these linear or these uh, familial lines and everything like that. They always choose the sun. I don't know why. I don't agree with it. Doesn't matter. That is what happens. So Sophia Butella plays Aminette. She notices that she her time is going to come, that she's going to get passed over. She's also an adult when this baby boy was born, which is really strange. Mostly because what I know of history is people didn't live that long and they didn't have babies late in life. So that there's like a 20-year gap between Aminet and the uh, baby baby boy or whatever. It was kind of strange to see. But she makes a deal with essentially the devil. They don't ever clarify. It's just this demon that it's like the demon of life and death. She makes a deal. She kills the baby, kills her father. And then she tries to release a demon into the world through her chosen beloved... Um, I said at this point, dear Lord, this is dark, therefore the dark universe. And I will also say the color palette was very dark for this movie as well. It really was a dark universe. So after that happens, basically she tries to kill her boyfriend to release this demon into the world because she needs to kill a mortal man for him to take over this demon. Basically the ritual gets interrupted she gets mummified he gets killed all this stuff happens so now we flash to mesopotamia or iraq present day and people are shooting these historical figures and so we meet our two main characters our two main characters are played by tom cruise and jake johnson and honestly at this point i kind of like their chemistry i think a buddy comedy between the two would actually be okay uh, they're trying to figure out how to get rid of these insurgents that are shooting all the historical artifacts in Iraq and how they can go in and steal stuff. Basically, that's what they're doing. Jake Johnson says, why don't we like launch an airstrike? They'll launch or that will uh, make them run. And Tom Cruise is like, that's a bad idea because then we'll get 20 years in Leavenworth and because the military will know why we're here. And Jake Johnson goes, well, why not? I mean, we are looters anyway. 
And Tom Cruise says to him, we are not looters. We are liberators of precious antiquities. This line, this, this line, um, it's something else. And I mean, it's, it's funny because Jake Johnson and Tom Cruise, who, uh, Jake Johnson, his name is Corporal Vale. I have to clarify that because on the IMDb page, it says Sergeant, but he definitely never makes Sergeant. So Corporal Vale and Sergeant Nick, uh, can't remember his last name, but Nick, Sergeant Nick, basically Jake Johnson, Sergeant, or Corporal Vale, I'm going to say Sergeant Vale a lot, Corporal Vale says, I'm not going with you, I'm not going to try to kill all these insurgents because it's just not worth it, we're going to die. So to get him to do that, Nick cuts his water in the desert, and I said, what an asshole. Basically then, Jake Johnson's just like, you know the nearest water supply is like 100 miles away, this is the most worst thing you could have ever done, and Nick goes, no, the closest water supply is in the town, of course. He says, we're just going to slip in, slip out, get our stuff, and then go. What we didn't know as well is he stole this letter for, uh, uh, for this girl named Jenny, and it's signed by Henry, which we can only guess at this point is Henry Jekyll. They go in, everything's a shitstorm. They're running for their lives, running across rooftops. At this point, I've actually liked this movie. Like, it's okay. It's not great, but it's kind of fun. Jake Johnson and Tom Cruise really have decent chemistry. I, I I don't know if it would be the best buddy comedy, but it would be enough that I would actually like enjoy myself kind of thing. Well, so finally Jake Johnson has enough, and he's like, I'm going to launch an airstrike. I know you said not to, but I'm going to do it. Airstrike happens. All the insurgents run away, just like Jake Johnson said. It also reveals this big hole in the middle of the town, which reveals Harem, or Harem, or whatever it is, H-A-R-A-M. Um, which is this old town that basically is cursed. So, our colonel comes in, who's played by Courtney Vance. Courtney Vance, I love him. I don't know why he's not in more things, and he really was a minor part in this. Basically, he yells at the two, and we're just like, you guys are idiots, you were supposed to be 100 miles away, or 100 clicks away is what he said. The guys are, like, arguing with him, saying, oh, they, they thought they was prisoners or whatever, but the civilians had all been cleared, so they got the insurgents out of the way, and now we've got harem. Meanwhile, this girl comes up and is just like, oh, Morton, that's Nick's last name, Morton. Morton! And he turns around and she slaps him, like, immediately. And it's just like, how dare you steal my letter? How dare you go to harem without me? You're the worst human being on the face of the planet. And the colonel's like, what the hell do you guys have relations? And she goes, he thinks, or he thinks I'll be embarrassed by this, but I had him in my room the other day. He just basically stole this letter from me after 15 seconds of sex. Yes, we had a 15 second sex joke. And that is something that is recurring in this movie. At this point, I've made a note that Christopher McQuarrie, the writer for this thing, he is one of the most interesting guys on the face of the planet for writing. A lot of his movies are Tom Cruise stars, which is okay. The funny thing that is about Christopher McQuarrie is he got a start on NYPD Blue for like one episode as a writer. Then he wrote The Usual Suspects, which is my second favorite movie of all time. I definitely enjoy it, and I think it's one of the best written even. So it's really weird when you consider some of the other things. He wrote a couple other things, then Valkyrie, then The Tourist, uh, both of which I say were subpar, then Jack, the, uh, Jack Reacher and Jack the Giant Slayer, all of which at this point are just very subpar to me. And then he wrote Edge of Tomorrow, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, The Mummy in Between, Mission Impossible Fallout, Top Gun Maverick, and the next two Mission Impossible movies coming out, Dead Reckoning Part 1 and Dead Reckoning Part 2 which I didn't even know had a title at this point, but I'm happy to know that now. So he's one of those people, I just think he has the weirdest track record for writing, because I think he has some of the best out there, and then he has some of the worst out there. So they go into this cave, obviously, because they need to see what's inside it. And they find out that there's just mercury dripping from the ceiling, and they don't see an issue with it. They just, like, literally catch it on their bare hands, and they're like, it's mercury, look at this, ah! And... <laughs> 
obviously Jenny's with them. She's an archaeologist. We don't know what of, but she's an archaeologist. She knows a ton of stuff. She reads this thing and it's like a warning to keep or to intruders to keep people out. Obviously, at this point, she's reading to a camera. So we get the most exposition just because she's talking out loud to a camera, recording herself, telling people to keep out. There's all this jewelry and stuff like that. So, of course, our main characters, Jake Johnson and Tom Cruise, start stealing anything they can get their hands on. Jenny finds out that all this mercury is leading into a pool. And then the Watchers, which are these Egyptian gods, are facing in towards the pool instead of out. Which means we don't care about what's coming in. We care about what's coming out. So, obviously, it's a prison. This dialogue is completely predictable because at this point I've read all of it and said basically every line, line for line. They're about to get bombarded by more insurgents. The radio's like, you need to get out of there. Insurgents are coming, blah, blah, blah. Jenny's like, I need more time. You need to get this thing out of there because I need to see what it is. So Tom Cruise just shoots this chain that's holding this prison in and basically it rises out of the mercury. And spiders start coming into the tomb, and Jake Johnson gets bit. Also, Tom Cruise starts seeing flashbacks. We don't know how at this point, but he sees flashbacks, and basically it shows her or it shows him the mummy, and she has chosen him, and they share this passionate kiss. And the reason he sees her is because he freed her. So I know right now he's the next mortal man sacrifice because he's going to become the god of death, whatever. They don't even say it at this point, but it's pretty obvious at this point. So they get out of the hole. They get the uh, tomb out. I don't know, or the sarcophagus out. I don't know how they did that so quick, especially with the insurgents coming. But they just did somehow. And all these crows start flying into the desert and landing. And they're kind of like, Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. They all know it's cursed. They all know Harem is cursed. Yet they don't think anything of these crows. So, what? I don't know what's happening there. I also swear at this point they called Jake Johnson Nick. So both Tom Cruise and Jake Johnson's characters are named Nick. Even though one is named Corporal Vale, who doesn't have a first name. Except for maybe this Nick part. And then Sergeant Nick Morton. They get onto this plane. Nick sits next to Jenny. And Corporal Vale, Jake Johnson, is basically laying on his own. And his eyes just go into his head. That all happens. He's chilling, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, Nick and Jenny are talking about this 5,000-year-old sarcophagus, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's everything like that. And then she, then, then Nick goes, Why did you mention to the colonel that it was 15 seconds of passion? Like, it was definitely more than that. And Jenny's going, this is the biggest discovery of my life. And you want to talk about the sex? Really? So she walks away. They all kind of fall asleep. Nick has a flashback to see this girl and finds out that he's being called Sentapaye, which is the chosen one. And he wakes up all of a sudden out of nowhere because he saw that this ceremonial dagger is getting jabbed into his chest. And he sees that Jake Johnson is standing over the sarcophagus. Courtney Vance, the colonel, is standing over and going like, What the hell are you doing? Get away from that, blah, blah, blah. And Jake Johnson stabs him twice. At this point, this movie is okay. Like, I'm all right on this. Well, they're freaking out about the fact that Jake Johnson has, like, his eyes in the back of his head and he's just, like, walking towards them. So he accidentally gets shot three times by Nick. So I'm thinking to myself, there goes your biggest stars. Courtney Vance doesn't come back the rest of the movie, and Jake Johnson is gone for a significant amount of time. They're trying to figure out where they're going, so they go to the pilots, and these birds all of a sudden fly into the engine, and they fly into the cockpit, and the plane is going down, and we get the trailer scene. This is... The scene that you've seen uh, where the plane's going down, uh, Nick gives Jenny a parachute and like pulls it, gets her safe, and then Nick crashes into the ground. Tom Cruise is dead. That's the end of the movie, right? No, there's much more. I'm going to take a quick break. 
I'm going to give you a promo as well for our friend Being Bookish Podcast. Uh, Ray is amazing. Check her out. Literally, she is one of the first people we met on Twitter. She is truly phenomenal. Her show is amazing. I, I can't say enough about her, so please be sure to check out her show. Uh, of course, after you listen to us. But here is her promo, as well as you can find her on Twitter at being underscore bookish. It is a world of spoiler-free book reviews in a podcast, all fiction genres, always looking for fiction book recommendations, and she is based in the UK. So here is Ray's promo for her show, Being Bookish. I'll see you after the break. Light the candles, get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled, and settle back to enjoy a selection of 100% spoiler-free book reviews. Whether you're a fan of cozy mysteries, horror, romantic comedies, science fiction, or anything else you might find on the bookcase, Being Bookish is a great place to start. Join me, your host Ray, as I take a joyride through the books on my bookshelves and journey into new territories with recommendations every week. You may even hear a few interviews with authors along the way. Find every episode of Being Bookish wherever you find your podcasts. We are back. I hope you enjoyed that promo. Seriously, Ray is one of our best friends in the business. Uh, I'm only on page two of my five-page notes. I thought this was only going to be 40 minutes, but it may be longer. We'll see what happens. Who knows? Uh, Tom Cruise is dead. The plane has crashed. Um, And basically, they need Jenny to identify the bodies. Well, Tom Cruise wakes up. And he's in a body bag, and he unzips himself. And at this point, I'm sitting there going, why do they have a zipper on the inside of a body bag? That's insanely creepy to me. I, I really hope that's not true, because if there if this happens more than once, that somebody wakes up after being dead, uh, there's a problem. He has a toe tag on, he's like freaking out. He also sees Jake Johnson. And Jake Johnson is still looking like he has his eyes in the back of his skull. He basically says to him, we're both cursed. You need to do whatever she wants so that we can get past this curse right away. And then, of course, there's this whole scene of Jenny and the medical examiners coming into the room. And he's naked. And he's talking to himself in the room. So Jenny's on to him and is like, hmm, there's something weird with him. Maybe I should take him to go see Henry. Meanwhile, we have a scene across London. Basically, there's these guards that have found the wreckage of the plane. They're trying to figure out what they can salvage and everything like that. One of the guys comes across the sarcophagus and it's empty. And then we get a bird jump scare. Because you know what's better than normal jump scares? A bird jump scare. The guy is examining the sarcophagus. Uh, He sees this body outside of the sarcophagus and is like, okay, I need to check out this body. Flips her around and it's the mummy. And she is looking skeleton-ish. And so we're all kind of like, cool, you know, she's, she's been dead for this many years. The guard is just kind of like, this is no problem, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden she grabs him and kisses him. I don't know why she has to kiss him to kill this guy. Basically, she, like, sucks the life force out of him. He becomes this skeletal mess and also becomes a zombie. There's a second round of exposition where Jenny is explaining to Tom what has happened, as well as then uh, Tom Cruise goes to the bathroom, which is, of course, a women's room because, you know, comedy. And he sees Jake Johnson in the mirror, who also says, like, this is the curse, this is what happens, you are supposed to be killed because you're this mortal man and you will become the god of death. Um, He sees also these rats that start attacking him, and they're just horrible CGI. But he has seen this vision of this church he needs to go to. He goes to the church, these zombies attack him, obviously Jenny comes and saves the day. But before that happens, the mummy is, like, about to stab the dagger into his chest and realizes the dagger's jewel is gone. And so I call this Deus Ex Missing Dagger Jewel. 
I don't know how the dagger got there in the first place. That was something that was always very confusing. And basically they're talking after after they get past the zombies, after they get past the mummy, they start talking. Like Jenny and him start talking. And it just becomes like so serious, so melodramatic. And it's this movie, what the biggest problem with it is, is it flips from melodrama to like Marvel humor where it's like very forced and out of nowhere and it doesn't serve a purpose. It's just there. They get attacked and their ambulance, which is the most inconspicuous vehicle ever. And so like the mummy is like standing over Nick and is about to like bring him to get the jewel and everything like that. When all of a sudden she starts getting shot with all these like harpoons and these like blow darts and whatever. And basically it's, this mysterious crew we don't know who they are and they also shoot nick and then jenny's just fine we get taken to the monstera de prodigium which is basically a warning of monsters this is the home of jekyll and his team and just in case you didn't put two and two together that is dr jekyll and mr hyde i think y'all are smarter than this movie is he basically grabs like this, I'll say, cure, and he starts transforming into Hyde and jams himself in the hand so that he doesn't become Hyde. And it just reminds me that they wanted this dark universe just so badly. They, they, they were setting it up and everything like that. They thought, no way this fails. We're going to get this dark universe. Yeah, no, mm-mm. So they take him over to the mummy. The mummy is being like, I'm in, uh, she is basically tied up. They have these things going into her neck that are just filling her blood with mercury. So it's basically going to kill her. And then they are going to dissect her and find out what makes her tick and everything like that. And of course, Jenny's upset about it. She's like, this is the best discovery I've ever made. I've been working for you and your secret government for forever. What the hell? And they also f tell Nick that he's connected to her and he won't ever get away because he's cursed and she's inside his head. So she's inside his head and we need to figure out how to get you away from this curse. There's this whole conversation between Jenny and Nick where she's like, I know you're a good man. I know because you gave me the only parachute without hesitation and when the plane was going down. And he goes, I thought there was another parachute. And like it's like 100% just like awkwardly delivered and I just put get wrecked <laughs> at this point. Jenny starts talking to the mummy to try to get her to like release Nick from this curse. She of course is like no he's been the chosen one. I, at this point I also think if Nick is cursed and the chosen one like they just kill him. Just kill him. Because then she can't get what she wants. That's what Jekyll was thinking as well. And so they get the jewel and they bring it because the one place that would be perfect for them to bring this jewel and this dagger together is where the mummy is. It's, you know, movie logic. So they have it all together and they're just like, we're going to kill you, Nick, but it's for the greater good. And basically Jekyll starts having these problems and you're like, oh, he's going to turn into Mr. Hyde. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be a problem. Nick grabs his antidote and Meanwhile, Aminette is able to get free enough from this Mercury thing to get a bug that she can control, like a literal bug cockroach thing, to go into the security guard's ear to free her. So, Hyde and Nick are having this fight. There's a security guard that's basically worried about the fact that Jenny's just, like, running around in the facility, even though Jenny is just, like, trying to go to the mummy and make sure she doesn't escape. Like, everybody probably should. And the security guard frees Aminette. Uh, she starts vomiting this fake mercury, and it's like really bad CGI fake mercury. And Nick is having a hard time with Hyde, but they're locked in this room together because the facility knows what Hyde's problems are, and they won't let him get away. And so they're just like fighting and like throwing each other around the room, blah, blah, blah. Nick gets away enough that he can grab the antidote and just jabs him in the chest. And, like, Hyde's like, good work, and then throws him across the room and then starts convulsing and becomes Jekyll. When did Russell Crowe become bad at acting, by the way? 
because this was awfully acted. It was terrible. There's no good delivery of lines for either character. I was hoping it would be better because I thought he could handle this. This would be a good role for him. Nope. Mm -mm. So they find out that, or Jenny says, well, if we destroy the stone, we can save the day and you won't be cursed anymore. Blah, blah, blah. They're like, okay, we're going to grab this stone. We're going to destroy it. So Nick and Jenny run together. Of course, there's this fire that explodes up, separates the two, and Nick stops because Aminette is in his head and is like, I'm going to save you. No, that's not what happens. Aminette runs away, grabs a dagger, and is like, I'll see you another time, and like runs away to where these this crypt was found because she's like, I can make these guys zombies. You know, as they do. Nick and Jenny run away. There's this sandstorm through the city, which is probably one of the best powers that she has, and they only use it once. It's a waste of time. And then Nick sees uh, Vale, or Jake Johnson, and Jake Johnson's just like, come on, I can help you. I can help you get the stone, and I can help you smash it. I don't get this part, because literally Vale told him, you need to do what she wants so we can break the curse. It's not even like a you were tricked into this believable situation. You knew what his intentions were from the beginning. You knew exactly what he wanted. So I just don't get it. I don't get that, and I don't get the zombies, and I don't get anything at this point besides the fact the mummy wants to kill Nick, Jenny wants to save him, and Nick's worried now because obviously Jenny is going to die. That's what he is told by Jake Johnson. I... At this point, grabbed my beer, and literally it was five seconds. And now they were just underwater. Long ago in the news position, they mentioned that it was under the river. So I'm wondering if the mummy, like, opened the wall or something like that, and the river just started flowing. And basically, the zombies grab Jenny away. Nick tries to save her. There's, like, 50 zombies, the mummy... And one cursed hero. I wonder who's going to win. Aminette has killed Jenny. Jenny is dead. Like, completely dead. I thought it was just going to be one of those situations where, like, oh, your kiss has woken me up. It wasn't that. And Aminette thinks she has a handle on the situation. So, of course, she sends away the zombies. She's feeling confident. She knows at this point. So, she's like, I'm in Nick's head. I can kill him. He can become the god of death. And especially because I killed his girlfriend, if he becomes a god of death, he might be able to bring her back so that she can live a normal life without him, but at least live a normal life while he just goes on this rampage and starts killing people with Aminet as his queen. Nick's like, no. Mm -mm. You, you killed the girl I love, which I've only slept with for 15 seconds or whatever it is at this point. And so they get into this huge fight. She throws Nick, like, neck first into a stone tablet. His body literally crumples in the CGI where his neck goes across the uh, tablet and looks like it's probably snapped, yet he lives through it. There's a bunch of scenes like that where she just kind of, like, <laughs> basically does something that would probably kill him and he survives somehow. So then he's like... Uh, she's trying to convince him, if I kill you, I make you this god of death, you can bring her back. And he's like, maybe this is a good idea. So he gets close to her, and he's like, I can get the dagger, I might be able to pull this off. And she licks his face. I don't know why, again, she's just so sexual. I don't I don't get it. I don't know why. They, they never explain it. They never say, like, she needs to be sexual to get life force or whatever. He says something like, I, I don't remember the exact line, but he said, like, I'm going to save her. And so she throws him across the room again. Uh, there was a wooden box coffin that he was thrown into, and his dick literally went into this wooden box. Like, it, it went curved into it, and he just gets up fine. But he also grabbed the dagger from her, from her and starts smashing the stone. And... She's like, no, no, no. If you give me the dagger, you'll be the god of death. You can bring him back. I bring her back. Do it. Don't, don't, don't leave her. And so he's like, well, if I'm the god of death, 
I can bring her back on my own. So he stabs himself and kills himself and becomes the god of death. He is set. Like, uh, set is the god of death. He is set. So he's like walking close to Amonet and is like, my love, we will control this world together. And he sees behind her Jenny's lifeless corpse. And all of a sudden, he just starts fighting it with willpower, but in the very Tom Cruise way of just like, ah, 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 you know, very Tom Cruise way. So he's just going to fight it with willpower. You know, that's going to work. And he starts seeing all these people that are telling him, like, if you kill yourself, you'll be the greater good. Like, you'll get uncursed. You'll be able to destroy Amonet. And so all of a sudden, he just gets like this superhuman strength tosses Amonette across the room and keeps fighting her, blah, blah, blah. And, like, it's just, I'm going to destroy you and everything like that. And finally, he gets her crumbled to the ground. He kisses her and sucks the life out of her and just throws her skeletal corpse away. And so then he, like, rushes to Jenny and is like, Jenny, wake up! Jenny, Wake up! Like this deep voice and he has like these crazy teeth and it looks like he's almost like a leviathan or something like that. And she wakes up and he's gone. He's like 40 feet away and we don't know this at this point, but he's just gone. And she's like, how am I alive? And he's like, good, you're alive. And she like walks up to him, but he's in the shadows. And so we don't know what he looks like. We don't see what he looks like anymore. But he sacrificed himself for her, so she's like, oh my god, like, I'm so grateful for you, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I don't want to hurt you, so I'm going to go away before Jekyll and his crew come. And so I just kept wondering, is he, like, the Wolfman? Is he Dracula? Is he a Leviathan? Is he a mummy now? Like, we don't know. And the line that was given as Jekyll comes in, he goes, he found his redemption, but it was at a great cost. He's a monster now. And somehow he also brings Jake Johnson back to life now. And they're in the desert, back where they started, essentially. But Nick has his face wrapped up by, like, turbans and stuff. So we don't know what he is. And Jekyll just says to Jenny in, like, this exposition to close the movie, Well, we may have to hunt him one day, but sometimes it takes a monster to fight a monster. And they put the uh, uh, Amanet into this Mercury tomb again and said that he's still connected to her so she may come back someday and that's the end of the movie and that is the end of the dark universe that they were trying to create because it just didn't work <sighs> this movie um i don't know there's just points at it of just boring and then the, there's so much talking it would be totally cool if this movie was more action-packed and everything like that and i also don't get the tone because like sometimes it's super serious and sometimes it's like the 90s mummy which never got too serious to outweigh the fun, which is why I think that movie worked more. Plus, Brendan Fraser, I think, is a better comedic actor. I know Tom Cruise had his moments like earlier on and everything like that, and he still has some good depth to his comedy, but like Brendan Fraser was able to balance the action and the comedy, and it worked. And I especially think it worked for a movie like The Mummy. If you would have put Tom Cruise in the 90s Mummy, I don't think it would have worked the same. So that's one of those things that just throws me off about this movie because sometimes it's just super serious, like melodramatic, uh, over-the-top drama and everything like that. And then sometimes it's this Marvel joking, like, oh, 15 seconds of sex, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And I don't know. It just didn't work. It, it just didn't. Russell Crowe was awful. Um, Jenny was great. She's Annabelle, uh, what's her last name? I want to get it right. Annabelle Wallace. Uh, Sophia Butella played Amonette. And I think she just didn't have enough to do because she was actually pretty decent for the Egyptian at first and then the mummy for the entirety of the movie. Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise. He's doing stunts, which is great. He did a lot of good stunts. Um, this movie won a lot of awards of, like, Bad Movie, Worst Movie of the Year, uh, Worst Supporting Actor in Russell Crowe, blah, 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 all, the, like, all this stuff. Um, but one of the things they did win was Best Stunt Rigging. And I will say some of the stunts are very well done, what you can expect in a Tom Cruise movie. So, yeah, that's uh, 2017's The Mummy, the bad movie for this week. Um, overall... It wasn't awful, 
but it wasn't amazing either. I'd give it a one out of five. Um, let's go spiders. One out of five spiders. So, yeah, it wasn't terrible, but it's not anything special either. I do not recommend it for anybody that's, like, looking for a funny slash action-packed movie. I think there's a bunch of better options out there. And especially, like, desert-themed. If you want a good desert-themed, watch Sahara. I think it's an underrated comedy action movie. Um, compared to this especially, I think it's uh, Citizen Kane to this movie. But that is 2017's The Mummy. This is Game for a Movie. I've been your host, Mike. We will hopefully have our whole group together. Uh, stay tuned for iStream, which may come out hopefully in two weeks, especially if we can't get together for a Game for a Movie episode. Like I said, that's going to be a lot more sporadic because I'm just going to do that when we don't have a Game for a Movie episode. Obviously, we are trying for Game for a Movie to be Game for a Movie, but this is under the Game for a Movie Network umbrella. Um, I think I'm going to call it Game for a Network. Who knows? I don't know at this point. I'm still making it up as I go. But yeah, so I've been Mike with Game for a Movie, where we ask, are you game for a movie? We will see you next time on Game for a Movie. Bye.